we have three presenters with us today. So we have Doris uh, Steinwall. So Dolores is, joined the Lymphedema Association of Ontario as a director in April 2019 and was appointed president in August 2019. She has been a volunteer on the Sunnybrook Patient Family Advisory Council since 2015 and has been volunteering with Wellspring since 2016. We also have with us Anne Demena. So Anne is the clinical director and owner of Markham Lymphatic Center, a multidisciplinary clinic located in Markham, Ontario. Anne is a graduate of the University of Waterloo where she received a degree in biochemistry as well as the University of Toronto where she received a degree in physiotherapy. She has also wrote the Complete Lymphedema Management and Nutrition Guide which is designed to educate patients about self-management strategies. We also have with us today Louise Haley. So Louise opened Breast Rehab, formerly Haley Rehab, a private physiotherapy clinic specializing in cancer rehabilitation in 2004. Over, with over 30 years of experience in healthcare, and she holds a degree in physiotherapy from McMaster, as well as nursing from Lakehead. Louise is certified in lymphedema management, ADP, acupuncture, dry kneading, and ergonomics. So with that, Dolores, I will pass it over to you to get us started for today. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to uh, in welcome you to the webinar today that the LAO, the Lymphedema Association of Ontario, is doing in partnership with Wellspring. Uh, Wellspring has been well known to me since my cancer journey, and uh, uh, I have greatly benefited from a number of their programs that they have done. And uh, I am now speaking about the Lymphedema Association of Ontario. Next slide, please. I would like to just um, give you a quick um, story uh, of my own journey. I was diagnosed with breast cancer in August of 2014. Very quickly thereafter, I had surgery on September the 30th. It's funny how those dates never seem to go away. I can quote them without even thinking about it. I had two lumpectomies and all of my lymph nodes removed from my right underarm. Uh, of course, it followed with chemotherapy, which was a difficult time for me. And then um, about 36 treatments of radiation. So it was a tough time, you know, during that time period. Um, approximately a few months later, I discovered uh, that I had lymphedema. And at the time, you know, um, I guess at the early stages, perhaps um, the nursing staff had mentioned this to me, but certainly it wasn't anything that was on my radar. And it never is, generally speaking, for cancer patients, because you're not thinking about that. You're worrying about how you're going to deal with cancer. However, good news, you know, we are now in 2022. I'm getting close to being eight years out. Um, so that's good news. Uh, I'm still cancer free. Uh, I've had a few scares in the past few months, but everything is good. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, um, thank you. Thank you for your congratulations. I know one of the things that is uh, was important to me and still is today is to meet people that are ahead of me in the journey. You know, somebody who is nine years out, somebody who's 10 years out. And all through my journey, that was important to meet other people and talk to other people because uh, the fear of recurrence is, is a very strong thing. And that also is something that never goes away. It's always in the back of your mind. Um, so what comes after cancer? Now, uh, this uh, is um, doesn't happen to everyone. I want to be clear about that. But lymphedema, it's a chronic lifelong condition that requires management, treatment, com compression, nutrition, and exercise. These are some of the things that I learned along the way. I couldn't just ignore it. I needed, you know, I needed to wear a sleeve. I needed to exercise. 
I need to manage my weight. I'm not very good at that, I'll admit. And um, also watch uh, watch what I eat. Um, other ways that you can uh, to get lymphedema, and Anne and Louise will probably talk more along those lines, probably Anne, because she sees many lymphedema patients. You can get it from birth, you can get it after surgery. It doesn't have to necessarily be cancer related. Uh, you could have an accident. I've talked to many people that have been in accidents or had surgery that had resultant lymphedema. So that's basically any trauma to the body. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So I wanted to share some stats with you because I don't, I believe that people are not aware of how widespread this is. Um, and this survey, um, these numbers that I'm quoting are pretty, uh, you know, are actually quite old in the sense that some of these numbers were taken probably in 2016 or a little bit later than that. And the numbers were also based on the, the last census. And the study was done um, uh, by um, basically a, a number of people. But this is the, the most current number that I have that uh, has been validated. Um, and this number was put forward by the Canadian uh, uh, um, Lymphatic Framework. So there's over one million people across Canada that have lymphedema. And there are over 400,000 people in Ontario. Again, as I said, these numbers are old, but this is very, very significant. Um, in my journey um, after my cancer and I found out that I had lymphedema, I decided to join the LAO. Um, I was never aware of it at the beginning that there was a Lymphedema Association of Ontario, or even that it, this was so widespread. So I wanted to join, I decided to join, I did. I wanted to make a difference, I wanted to raise awareness, and I wanted to do whatever I could, you know, to educate people, to help people, uh, to try to help them to get diagnosed and to help them to get treatment. Um, next slide, please. So one of the reasons, one of the main reasons is I realized that there was no treatment anywhere, anywhere for people. And the cost of treatment isn't really all that cheap, but um, uh, it takes a lot of money and a lot of people do not have medical insurance to cover it. Uh, also, um, the government program, the Authorized Distributor Program, ADP, as it's known to us, provides us uh, with garments, some garments, not all that everyone needs, but they do provide uh, assistance in this, but they do not provide any treatment whatsoever. And I myself found that difficult to understand for the simple reason that you need to have treatment, like I need to do a treatment on my arm before uh, before I put my sleeve on. <laughs> you know, and I'm, I try to do that myself a, a couple of times a day, but I also go to a physiotherapist um, to, to get treatment on a regular basis so I can manage my swelling. So uh, I wanted to la launch what we call the Compassion Fund. And I had raised some money um, at my own home doing my own little grassroots walk. And when I joined the LAO, I wanted to launch this. And so we did come up with trying to do a pilot to try to figure out how many people would we get you know, for treatment and how many could we actually handle given that our budget was very, very small. And the plan was to provide assessments. So assess it, the therapist was to assess it, provide two or three treatments uh, and teach each patient self-management techniques because you have to learn how to look after yourself. Otherwise it would be difficult to maintain uh, paid treatment all along. So that was basically my thinking when we did this. Next slide, please. So um, we, 
raised, we did a, a fundraiser um, in 2020. And we were, we were, that was during COVID, but so it had to be a virtual fundraiser. But we had uh, quite a bit of success. We raised $15,000 and we were able to approve uh, approximately 20 applicants for treatment. So again, in 2021, uh, we did another one because again, we were doing this, had to do it virtually because of uh, COVID. Though in the latter part of 2021, I myself did a physical walk with my friends and family because we could be outside. So we were able to raise $20,000. So we can now maybe, you know, possibly, I'm not sure about this, but double the number of people that we can offer this to. Uh, there are, I just want to say, there's no restrictions for who can um, apply for this, patients can apply for this. There are some restrictions uh, with regards to finances, because this is targeted at people that don't have insurance and cannot afford treatment. And uh, the recommendation coming from their doctor and their therapist and the other important part of this is that this um, funding is available to LA or uh, member therapists in that we know that they are trained on CDT and MDT, uh, MLD and uh, that they are registered with us uh, and we pay them directly. The next slide, please. So um, without taking too much time, I want to ask, you know, um, everyone here, like, what can you do to help? I mean, knowing the, the number of people that have it and the number of people that have lymphedema really, really badly, please uh, just, I would ask that you perhaps join us help us to advocate for more tre for treatment, uh, for a few more, you know, bandages that people need. Um, uh, and also, so if you could volunteer some of your time or donate to us, uh, that I would really appreciate that. With that, um, we are there to help you. So if you have any indication that you are getting lymphedema or you think you might, please, call us. Um, our website is av available. We have an info line. We pro provide some resources. So please don't hesitate to call us. With that, uh, I'm going to hand off to Anne and Louise. Oh, I, I guess I'm handing off to Vinita to introduce Anne. Is, I'm not yes. quite sure. Okay. Yes, so I'm going to stop. Um, I will stop my share. Thank you. Okay. And I will have Anne pull up her presentation to jump to her portion of the lecture. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So this is me. I'm Ann Domena. Um, I'm going to talk basically about the lymphatic system first, how it's designed, because I think People need to understand how the lymphatic system is designed and how it works before they um, understand how treatment works. Because some people um, do think that the treatment is a very um, simple treatment, a very light technique, and they have a lot of questions about how something so light tends to work. Um, so I'm going to explain about the system. So this first is a picture of the body and it shows all the lymphatic flu the lymphatic system, um, including the lymph nodes, which are the little gray dots that you will see around the neck, um, in the underarm, and, and around all of the organs. Um, and these lymph nodes connect to this spider-like network, which are the lymphatic vessels, um, that also then there's lymphatic or lymphoid tissues, we call them the thymus and the spleen, and also the tonsils there um, that have some lymphatic um, tissue as well. So these are the components of the lymphatic system. Um, in the lymph nodes, you have between five and 600 lymph nodes that are really scattered from, if you want to think, just below your chin, all the way down to your hip bones. That's where all those five to 600 lymph nodes are. And in your underarm, you have around 40 to 60 lymph nodes. And these lymph nodes are very, very important in clearing the lymphatic fluid. 
This slide just shows that there are, you know, your circulatory system, um, including the red side, which is your arteries, and then the blue side, which is your veins. And this is like a continuous loop system. So it actually is one system. The arteries um, will, you know, drop and leave behind some fluid and some blood for the tissue so that they can get nourishment. And then just continues on into the veins where the veins then pick up this um, excess uh, blood that's being distributed and the fluid that hasn't fallen out um, into the surrounding tissue area. The lymphatic system is then the second part of the circulatory system um, that will be like an open-ended system that is there to pick up all that fluid, protein, and debris that sits outside of the cells that the body hasn't used um, to nourish itself. Okay, so this just shows a close-up of the skin. So the purple here are the skin cells, and this gray is sort of the area around the skin cells, the tissue. So this area shows the capillary. The capillary is the red um, vessel there that goes up to the skin, again, leaving behind some nourishment, leaking out some fluid, including leaking out what we call lymph fluid um, in order to nourish the cells. And then the blue um, venule, which carries the blood back to the heart. But you can see that this green lymphatic vessel runs very close to and parallel with the vascular system. And it is around every blood vessel you have. So wherever you have veins and arteries, you always have a lymphatic vessel because the lymphatic vessel's job is to pick up all the fluid that sits outside of the cell in return, 100% of that fluid sitting outside the cell back to the heart so that it can re-enter circulation with the blood. And what happens is it just goes to the liver, the kidneys, the bladder, and you urinate out the excess lymphatic fluid as well as the components of the lymphatic fluid that are there. Um, the components of lymphatic fluid are proteins, large molecular weight proteins that don't fit in the channels of the veins, um, also debris from cell breakdown, um, any cytokines or uh, chemokines that haven't been picked up by the vascular system would leave through um, the lymphatic system, as well as any breakdown of cell materials or any toxins in the system. Those leave through the lymphatic system and would enter the heart. So the functions of the lymphatic system are to transport these large molecular weight proteins. So really big proteins that again do not fit between the channels of the veins. Um, to clear debris and toxins from around the space, around the cells, to recirculate um, lymphocytes, which are these defense mechanisms. So it's, the lymphatic system is really part of your immune system to detect bacteria and viruses and cancer cells in the area, to make these fighter T cells in a large amount, and then to send those fighter T cells out through the lymphatic system to kill um, bacteria, viruses, or cancer cells. So this would be something that people notice when they have tonsillitis, um, when people have infections in their throat and they go to the doctor and the doctor feels around their neck and says, oh, your glands feel enlarged. The glands that feel enlarged are the lymphatic, um, are the lymph nodes. So that's when those fighter T cells are being produced. Um, it's also re um, responsible for moving large molecular weight, waste materials and all the waste materials um, it's there to make sure that you never swell. So it's sort of like your check and balance. So no matter what happens to your body, whether you have an ankle sprain, um, you know, you have an injury to your leg or a bruise and there's a local swelling, your lymphatic system is responsible for clearing all of that local swelling and to prevent the swelling from happening. Um, so, you know, this is why it's very important um, when you have lymphatic fluid collecting in the area, the lymphatic system is 100% responsible for flushing out that lymphatic fluid and getting rid of the swelling. And then it's there, I always say, to maintain your body's inner balance. So maintain that homeostasis of the system and make sure that your system is, is, is healthy and functioning well. Other, fa other facts about the lymphatic is it does parallel the vascular system, responsible for moving 10% um, of the blood volume, if you want to think of it that way. Um, so the arteries move 90% basically of the blood right directly into the venous system. The 10% of that fluid that leaks out is the lymphatic fluid. 
Um, and the lymph nodes really work by contraction of the vessels of the lymphatic system. And I say that because this part becomes so important. Contraction of the walls of the lymphatic system can happen from muscle contraction, so exercise. It can happen through deep breathing as well, which is really important. Um, and then it can happen through manual lymphatic drainage, which will be um, what I move into as I talk about treatment of lymphedema. Um, and the system, um, it, this lymphatic system is compromised after, after you have surgery, after you have radiation, when they remove lymph nodes from um, the area, like the breast um, area or the axilla, um, when they do central node biopsies, lymph node dissections or radiation. So lymphedema is really um, characterized as swelling of any body part. It's the abnormal accumulation of lymphatic fluid, and it can occur in any area of the body. It can be in the arm, the leg, the chest, remaining breast tissue. Um, it can be in the abdomen or the groin or the head and neck area. With patients who have had breast cancer and lymph nodes removed from the underarm, we typically see lymphedema in through the arm, uh, we might see it on the same side where the lymph nodes are removed. We might see it in the remaining breast tissue or the chest wall. And sometimes we see it in the upper back as well on the same side in which the lymph nodes are removed. It is one of the most chronic complications after dissection of axillary lymph nodes. Um, and it does tend to progress. So this is important to remember that it, it's a very common complication. We, we do see it a lot. There are more recent studies in which they show over the course of a breast cancer um, survivor's life, uh, we do see lymphedema in 70% of those women um, across the course of their life. Of course, because uh, survival rates are, are becoming higher and higher with breast cancer, people are living longer and longer, you do tend to see the complication of lymphedema over time. So it's really important to understand uh, what the signs and symptoms are if you don't have it yet. So the incidence rate within two years of having um, your, your procedures and, and radiation and your cancer treatments, uh, the incidence is about 23 to 38%. So somewhere between 20 and 40% is typically what I tell people. And it's really diagnosed based on um, circumference. So how we measure your arm and we measure every four centimeters to determine that. Um, and typically people who are going to develop lymphedema, we say that 70% of people who develop lymphedema develop it within the first 12 months after you've had your breast surgery. But we do know that there are 30% of people who develop, who develop lymphedema later on. Those 30% can develop at any time from that one year after to I've seen 30 and 35 years after having um, their treatments completed. And the risk factors, so these are the, the, the things that might make you more predisposed to developing lymphedema, the number of nodes removed. So if you've had more than 10 lymph nodes removed, then your risk is higher. If the radiation um, was quite extensive, uh, you had a lot of units of radiation, so you've had 25 days plus boosts, um, then your incidence of lymphedema is a lot higher. The more zones in which the radiation occurred. So if it occurred above the collarbone into the neck, as well as the breast tissue and including the underarm and sometimes including the upper back, those are four zones of radiation. Your risk is higher for developing lymphedema. If you had post-operative infection um, at the wound site or the drain site, if you had surgical drains that were in for more than two weeks and were still draining more than 30 um, cc's, then your risk is higher of developing lymphedema. Um, if you have a poor range of motion or mobility in through the shoulder, and if you do have obesity as another um, complicating factor. So this is, you know, the person on, on the right has, or, or the person on the left has lymphedema. Um, in her right arm, which is quite enlarged, and after treatment, um, which is the picture on the on the right hand side, after treatment is is the reduction in which um, was achieved for this particular patient. So that is what lymphedema would look like. 
And I thought this time I would talk about the stages of lymphedema last year. I didn't talk about those stages, but I think the stages are really important because people have to understand that in stage zero, there are four stages. And stage zero is called the subclinical stage. There's no visible swelling, but people have the feeling of tightness or pain. And that can go on for months or years. And some people never progress beyond stage zero. They can stay in stage zero for years. Typically, I tell people in stage zero, um, if you have symptoms of heaviness, aching, and pins and needles, that is pretty characteristic that you're in stage zero lymphedema. And then stage zero is where we want to see patients. If we see patients in stage zero, we know that we have some control at preventing further progression, okay? Um, stage one lymphedema is early accumulation of fluid, this high protein rich lymphatic fluid. It's typically pit pitting. So when you press on your arm where the swelling is, your finger will sink into the tissue and it does tend to disappear with elevation or rest. So when people elevate their arm, they do find that the swelling goes away. Um, this is very early stage lymphedema. Again, we'd really like to see people in early stage because if we give you some self-management strategies and some compression, typically we can prevent things from progressing. Not in everybody, but there is some research showing that we can prevent that progression. But early management and detection is really key before the lymphatic system becomes further overwhelmed and debilitated. And almost as it becomes further overwhelmed and debilitated, what I see in our clients is that it actually has a hard time recovering such that we can then allow the system to return back to normal. Stage two lymphedema, limb elevation doesn't help. So the arm is swollen at this stage. When you elevate your arm, it doesn't help. The swelling doesn't tend to come and go anymore. That swelling is there almost all of the time. In early stage two, it might still be pitting, but at later stage two, it is no longer pitting. The swelling is there all of the time. Um, and it's really important to understand that treatment, again, at all these stages is important. So fibrosis could start to begin, which fibrosis is the hardening of the tissue. So you may notice that you have some hardened areas under the skin. Um, that's a progression um, that we try to avoid. Stage three is when the limb is very enlarged. This is called uh, lymphostatic elephantiasis. So the bit limb is very large. There's often skin changes, color changes, nodules to the skin. There may be little pores in the skin in which the lymphatic fluid starts to leak out. Um, and the, there's definitely no pitting at this stage and it can become very hard and very dense. In stage three is where we start to see people having other issues, um, reduced range of motion, difficulty with gripping things. So their grip strength becomes weaker. Um, walking can become affected and mobility can become affected. And that is a stage we try to avoid. And again, early diagnosis is important. Signs of onset, again, heaviness, tightness, bursting sensation in the limb or in the breast tissue, um, an increased size in the limb or puffiness in the area, a feeling of heat in the limb, shooting pains, pins, needles, aching, jewelry or clothing that becomes tight or doesn't fit anymore is also another sign. Signs of worsening lymphedema. So if you have lymphedema and you're wondering, is this getting worse? And maybe you're not seeing a therapist very often. It's getting worse if you're starting to get bouts of recurrent infections. I'll talk about infections later on in another slide. Compression garments are becoming too tight or they're painful to use. You have pins and needles in through your fingers or in through your toes. For breast cancer, it would be in through the fingers, of course. Um, and so you didn't have pins and needles before, but it's progressing now to develop pins and needles or you have areas that are numb. Um, you know, you're having grip strength issues. There's thickening or roughened areas, discolored areas or blister-like nodules. Uh, lymphorrhea, which is leaking in the skin or fibrosis. Again, mobility is affected. Other facts I think are important. Not everybody at risk of developing lymphedema will get it. So not every breast cancer patient will develop it. But again, there is higher rates um, of lymphedema as survival increases. Um, for breast cancer. Some will develop lymphedema right after their treatments and others years and years later. And again, those at risk can take measures to try and prevent the lymphedema. Treatment of lymphedema, I'm just going to talk about the gold standard and Louise is going to talk about some of um, the other treatments that they're using in their clinic up in Ottawa. But the most um, area is called CDT or combined decongestive therapy. 
Um, it needs to be done by a certified lymphedema therapist or a CDT certified therapist. So make sure that that is someone that you find in your area. And the purpose of, lymph, of the treatment is to reduce the size of the limb and then maintain the volume reductions that are achieved. Okay, so the goal is to try to reverse as much of um, the lymphatic uh, changes or symptoms that you're feeling um, so that it doesn't progress. And what we're doing is we're redirecting, we're rerouting it to secondary pathways so that those secondary healthy pathways can pick up that excess lymphatic fluid um, and move it. Combined decongestive therapy, really, I include five things in it. Um, it's four things, but five is important. Education is extremely important when you have lymphedema because it's a lifelong condition. You need to learn self-management. So education is key. Skin care, compression therapy, manual lymphatic drainage, and then exercise. So the education, you need to understand the lymphatic system. You need to understand that carrying heavy bags and purses um, on that side can definitely um, restrict the circulation of lymphatic fluid. You don't want to have tight clothing where there's elastic in the clothing that could be um, creating tourniquets in, in, on your limb. You want to take more rest breaks when you're doing repetitive exercises or repetitive activities um, when you're at work. No use of hot tubs, saunas, or any extremes of temperature, including um, hot and cold packs, shouldn't be used if you have swelling to try to reduce it because that's actually going to make the swelling worse. Um, and then those at risk of lymphedema need to wear compression garments um, when, air, when they're traveling by air. Um, I think that's essential when you're doing a lot of air travel because the cabin pressure changes can definitely cause some swelling. So there's a big component on education that has to happen for patients with lymphedema. Skin care. Um, a lot of people who have lymphedema notice that their skin becomes very dry and very flaky. So it's very important to keep the skin healthy so that there are no cracks in the skin so that you won't allow bacteria to get in because the skin is really your barrier against your environment to make sure that you don't let bacteria in or get infections called cellulitis. Um, whenever you get a cellulase infection, there's more damage to the lymphatic system in the area. And so after a cellulase infection or repeat infections, we do find the lymphedema does get worse. So we want to try to prevent those cycles of infection from happening. Um, so good skin uh, care products, pH of four to six. Again, I talk about it in the book. I can't give a list here. There's a list in the book about the lotions that have a pH of between four and six. Um, and I pulled all the research that was out there on dermatological products to put the, this together um, for patients. Prevent damage to the skin, so no needle punctures, um, no blood draws, um, no IVs on that side if you can. No heat or extreme temperatures. Um, bug spray in the summertime, prevent bug bites. Use sunscreen, protect, protect yourself from getting sunburns. Use an electric razor instead of a, a regular shaver so that you don't get nicks or, or cuts. Um, take care when you're cutting your nails so that you're not cutting the cuticles or the skin. Um, and then make sure, again, that you're not wearing tight clothing or jewelry. Infections. So unfortunately, infections do happen in a large percentage of people with lymphedema. Once you have one cycle of infection, you're 30% at risk for developing another one. Um, and so we want to prevent the infections as much as we can. So if you do develop signs, though, it's usually warmth in the limb, redness in the area, um, an increase in swelling if you already have lymphedema, and, um, itchy, uh, pain, tenderness, rash, or streaking. So it almost looks like lines of a rash up the limb chills or fever um, of 38 degrees or higher would be a fever. You need to seek medical attention right away. This is an emergency and we want to um, prevent more damage to the lymphatic system. So the faster you get on antibiotics, the less um, damage can happen to the, the lymphatic system. And we also wanna prevent this from going into the bloodstream um, where it can then cause other issues with other organs. Manual lymphatic drainage is another component. This is a specialized type of massage technique. I don't like to call it a massage 
but it's very similar to a massage where it's a very gentle stretching of the skin and it's done with a direction and it's done with a stretch. Now the stretch component is essential because stretching the skin actually increases the opening and closing of those channels of the lymphatic vessel that I showed you. Normally your system beats at five to 10 beats per minute. So lymphatic system is quite a sluggish system. When we do good manual lymphatic drainage for about 45 minutes to an hour, you increase the rate of those channels opening and closing to around 25 to 30 beats per minute. So you're picking up that much more of that lymphatic fluid when you're doing a good manual lymphatic drainage session. And it's really important that the therapist who's working with you understands where your deficiency is in your lymphatic system. And that's all based on skin feel and skin stretch. When the swollen, the limb is swollen, the skin does not stretch very much. As the therapist works, the increase in skin stretch does happen. And the therapist will be able to feel that with, with very good sensation in our hands because we've done it on so many patients and move the fluid out of the area. They need to understand how to do that and where to reroute it. We really are rerouting to pathways that already exist. They're alternative pathways for getting fluid out of the limb. And the body was designed with a very complex lymphatic system so that there were many different ways to move fluid out of an area and into a healthy area so that the lymphatic fluid can leave from the damaged area. Self-manual lymphatic drainage is a necessary component of this. When we get to compression, there's two phases of compression. So for people who are more than three centimeters larger in their limb, so they have a, you know quite a bit of swelling, it's noticeable. I like to bandage them right from the beginning because I want to try to reverse as much as we can. This is called the active phase of treatment. So it's multi-layer compression bandaging. It's three layer or four layer if we add in foam. This is to re reduce the limb again. There's a stock in it. Then there's a padding underneath. It can either be a light foam or a cotton padding. And then there's short stretch bandages, which are designed for lymphedema. Okay, and these bandages are put on in multiple layers to achieve the right pressure, the pressure that we need, higher pressure at the hand and a lower pressure at the top of the arm in order to create that pressure gradient to move the lymphatic fluid out and get rid of the swelling. And it works extremely well, amazingly well. Um, and so this is something that would be done for someone who has three or more centimeters girth difference from their unaffected side when we do measurements. The maintenance phase is the phase in which that's when you go into a compression sleeve. You do not go into a compression sleeve if you have a lot of lymphedema, if there's a lot of swelling, because a compression garment cannot shrink you. It cannot change. You cannot change the circumference of a compression garment. You can change the circumference of a compression bandage because we get to wrap it around your limb. So compression garments, um, gloves, sleeves, gauntlets, there's chin straps, there's daytime garments and nighttime garments. Daytime garments should be wear, worn from when you wake up to when you go to bed um, and removed when you go to sleep so that you don't constrict um, blood flow. And then nighttime garments can be used at night. Um, but this is done when the limb does reduce and there are many types of garments. So if you're in something that isn't comfortable, then you need to switch to something else because your garment should fit well, it should be comfortable, it shouldn't bunch, and it shouldn't cause more swelling or redness in the limb. So that's when you need to go back to your lymphedema fitter or your therapist and have the discussion about how your garment needs to change. Okay, and there's ready to ready to wear garments, and then there's also custom made garments for people. The assisted devices program is a program um, which is OHIP funded. It covers 75% of the cost of garments. You get two sets of garments, whether it's a glove, a sleeve, and a vest um, every four months. It needs to be signed by your oncologist. It needs to be signed by a certified lymphedema fitter that is registered, or therapist, sorry, certified lymphedema therapist that is registered with the ADP program. And then it needs to be sent to a fitter where you would go for your fitting. And your therapist would have an open communication with your fitter about what garment they want you in, whether it's an over-the-counter circular knit or whether it's a custom-made flat knit and what type of garment you need um, to maintain your lymphedema the best that you can. And you should never grow 
in your lymphedema sleeve or garment. If you're growing, then something needs to change about your garment. Either the pressure or the type of fabric that you're in um, needs to change so that you cannot grow in size in your lymphedema garment. The only way you know that is if you're being measured regularly. Exercise is another component. Um, this helps improve lymph and blood flow. Um, improve joint range of motion. And we know that there's a joint pump and a muscle pump to the lymphatic system. When you're moving the joints and you're contracting the muscles, you're, you're squeezing the deeper lymphatic vessels, which will help improve lymphatic flow. Muscle strengthening is important. It's a very important part of lymphedema management and all people should be doing some type of strengthening exercise. Um, and then you need to maintain a healthy body weight also with exercise. Start off using no weights and you progress to using weights. Please talk to uh, your lymphedema therapist to get yourself onto a proper exercise program. And exercise needs to be done with your bandages or your compression garments. And we try to return people back to the types of exercises in which they like. Weightlifting, there are many clinical studies out there that show that weightlifting weight is a very safe exercise for people to do, but you need to start it very slowly and you need to progress very slowly. Talk to your lymphedema therapist or even, you know, the physiotherapists that are at Wellspring um, also for their exercise program can also help you with finding the right exercises that you should do. But weightlifting um, really reduces the number, uh, the number, or, sorry, weightlifting reduces the number and the severity of symptoms that people have over time. Weightlifting has been shown to reduce the volume, but increasing muscular strength in my, in my mind, what it does is it gives people the ability to do their regular activities that they do day in and day out without constantly flaring up their lymphedema and having these exacerbations of their lymphedema and their symptoms. This is lymphatic taping. Um, it is an amazing tool that can be used to help also direct lymphatic fluid away from a congested area. That's um, a person with it on their legs because they have swelling in their feet and behind their ankle. And this is a person who had swelling in her forearm and in the back of her hand. Um, and this tape tended to help reduce their swelling. So lymphatic tape is really put along the pathways in which we want to move the fluid. It's anchored to a spot that we want fluid to move towards. And there's a little bit of stretch to the tape so that it literally lifts the skin up and gives the skin lymphatics the sensation of being pulled, um, almost stimulating those skin lymphatics so that they will sense that they can move the fluid along that tape. As you're doing exercise, you're getting contractions and you're getting stretched to your muscles and also to the skin that also helps stimulate those lymphatic vessels that are under the skin. And it can be applied for three to five days and you can shower and swim and everything with this on. Prevention of lymphedema is also another thing that I wanna highlight. Again, I talked about at the beginning, really important. There are a lot more research studies that have come out in the past two or three years that show that prevention is important and early detection of lymphedema does show that we can prevent the progression of lymphedema to later stages. Um, prevention is, is something I think we should be moving towards, especially with people who've had a lot of lymph nodes removed and have had a lot of radiation um, in, in, in their axilla or the underarm, you want to learn how to prevent the lymphedema from progressing. And sometimes it's as simple as learning self-management, some exercises, and also just putting on a compression sleeve for high-risk activities. That is my book called The Complete Lymphedema Management Nutrition Guide. It has almost everything I talked about in it and more and is research-based. If you need to reach me, please drop me an email. You can give the clinic a call. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have at the end of the presentation. I'm going to pass this over to Louise. Okay, so thank you, Anne. Thank you, Anne. Did you want me to, um, are you able to request a screen control of Anne's or would you like me to share? Oh, I'm going to stop share sharing. I stopped sharing so you can yeah. share. Perfect. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share Louise's presentation. All right. So Louise, um, all yours and just let me know when you need me to. Great. Thank you. Um, 
Great, thank you. Um, and I tried to answer some questions, but didn't get to all of them. <laughs> okay, I'll take a look while you're talking. Okay. All right, so great to be here. Thank you, Anne, for the background on lymphedema. It really flows into my presentation. And Dolores for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk about therapeutic modalities in breast rehab, primarily electric modalities, um, many of which in school were taught not to use, but I have had a lot of success over the past 20 years treating breast rehab patients with these modalities. So I'm going to go over the four top ones that I use in the clinic. Next slide. So by the end of the presentation, you'll understand the indications and contraindications for the use of ultrasound in breast rehab, dry needling, low level laser, and AccuHealth. I'm gonna outline the expected benefits from each modality. I'm gonna help you understand the specific use and benefit of the modalities used in breast rehab and understand the scientific research that support, supports the use of AccuHealth and low level laser in rehab setting. Next slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. The green um, is a little less known, and so I'm going to focus a bit more on low-level laser therapy and AccuHealth. But I will talk about ultrasound as well as dry needling and acupuncture. Next slide. So when I first got started in breast rehab of over 20 years ago, I worked for a former physiotherapist who was a medical oncologist, and one of the first machines that she um, secured for me was an ultrasound unit. Um, ultrasound is something I do use on a regular basis in, in my clinical setting. It's, it's a form of deep heat. Um, it has thermal effects at an injury site. It increases the phagocytic activity of inflammatory cells such as macrophages, so it really helps in diminishing swelling. It increases the release of chemical mediators from inflammatory cells, which affect and activate fibroblasts to the site of injury. And it stimulates and optimizes collagen production. So it can really improve functional strength of scar tissue. The contraindications is you would never put ultrasound over an implant, such as um, uh, like over a breast implant or over a um, total knee replacement or a hip replacement. You'd never do it on a malignant tumor or any area of decreased sensation because it's thermal, you, the patient wouldn't really feel it. So you wouldn't put it over like neuropathy. Again, reproductive organs, you'd stay away from high fluid areas, never the eyes, the testicles, or the heart. And you'd never put it over an open wound or skin disorders. So a big part, and Anne talked about this, a big part of lymphedema management is weight control, proper nutrition. A lot of the stuff she's outlined really well in her book. Um, every single patient we see here, we want to get them back to optimal health. That's what breast rehab therapists wanna do. And so ultrasound is a really good adjunct if you're treating someone, maybe a breast reconstruction patient who has sprained their ankle. I would definitely pull out the ultrasound. Or if you've got a tennis elbow on the opposite limb of the lymphedema side, I would definitely um, pull out the ultrasound. Next slide. Dry needling is something I've been using on breast cancer patients uh, for a number of years with good effect. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about the indications and the contraindications. It basically desensitizes super sensitive structures. And it does this by decreasing the spontaneous electric activity in a trigger point. A trigger point is a tight band of tissue. So if you were to feel your neck muscles right now, a lot of you probably are quite tight there. I think anybody with a cancer diagnosis or lymphedema diagnosis can get very tight in the neck. So dry needling would be something that I would consider treating with. It removes the source irritation and it restores motor function. So it unbinds the shortened microfibrils um, to restore muscle length. So when you have a big knot in a muscle, such as the upper fibers of the trapezius of your neck, that can impede lymphatic flow. And it is in a different pathway to where your nodes were removed. So you would never want to needle um, in the lymphedema limb, 
but that's not to say that you can't have dry needling in another area um, when undergoing breast rehab. It induces a healing response in the tissue and it promotes healing via local inflammation. So it's almost causing um, an inflammatory res response and with that, you get an uptake of healing. The contraindications for dry needling are inadequate practice knowledge. So you wanna go to someone certified. Um, physiotherapists can practice acupuncture. I believe massage therapists can physicians. Um, so you want to make sure that when you're going um, for dry needling, they, that person also understands the lymphatic system. I've seen patients where they're, they might have lower leg lymphedema. They're they come in, their entire leg has been needled and it has even created an onset of lymphedema. So make sure if you're going for dry needling, you're getting it from someone who is certified in lymphedema management. Uh, you never, uh, the therapist should never do it if consent is denied. Like we have some patients I just would never go there with dry needling because they are fearful of needles. Bleeding disorders. If someone's on an anticoagulant, a blood thinner, stay away with, from dry needling. Of course, pregnancy and in the area of joint replacement or over the rib cage or over, of course, an implant, breast implant. Next slide, please. So I've been using low-level la low laser therapy for approximately seven years, and it's been a game changer for me in my practice with lymphedema management. Uh, we, have, um, one, two, we have four laser units um, with different wavelengths. I'm gonna, this could be an entire lecture in itself, so I'm gonna try to really dummy it down um, because laser can be quite complex, the physiology of it and the understanding. But it is in low level laser is light therapy. It's a non-thermal, so it's not, so unlike ultrasound, ultrasound heats the area. It's a thermal modality. Laser is light and it does not heat. Um, and depending on which machine, uh, some of our machines have two, two wavelengths and some have three. So most of the lower cost lasers have two wavelengths. Visible red, which is 600 to 700 nanometers. And it does a superficial penetration of up to one centimeters, which is ideal for wound healing and superficial target sites like hands, feet. But this visible red is superb for lymphedema management because your lymphatics are your skin and, uh, and by bombarding light on fibrotic tissue or swollen tissue, it can be quite a game changer in reducing fluid. Near infrared is between 700 and 900, um, 904 nanometers. It's superficial as well, but a little bit deeper. So it can penetrate up to five centimeters it has a wide variety, uh, you, you can use it in a wide, wide variety of muscular skeletal conditions. So as certified lymphedema therapists, we're always looking at other joints that can be affected in cancer care. And we wanna get those joints back. So although you might be coming in to see a therapist for your lymphedema, the end part of the maintenance is to get you in good shape aerobically. So we use a lot of laser on orthopedic conditions. It's used to activate all three known cellular pathways simultaneously to aid in rehab. So some of our laser units, we can be administering three different wavelengths at the same time. And it's effective for treatment of a broad range of nerve, muscle, and joint conditions. Next slide, please. So how it works. So I, I, I did pull up, um, so my initial laser unit was the Medex, which is just a handheld, which I will show you. There's a picture of it later. Um, but the Theralase is a much more involved machine that has the three wavelengths. And I'll just talk to you briefly about the three different wavelengths. So light energy penetrates the skin and is absorbed by all cell types, i.e. muscle, joint, blood and nerve. So it attacks everything, the light, okay? Light energy is transferred into biomechanical energy, similar to photosynthesis in plants. 
and provides additional energy. So I want to talk briefly about the ATP pathway or the 660 nanometers. This activates chromophores. It increases ATP production. So when you have damaged cells, such as in lymphedema, you want an increase in ATP production to heal that cell. So it increases availability of energy for healing and it de decreases pain signaling. signaling. The next wavelength is the lipid absorption pathway, which is 905 nanometers, which I talked briefly about in the previous slide. And this, this increases the oxidative metabolism, which helps in, in improving tissue repair, improving nerve regeneration, and decreasing pain. So the majority of our lymphedema patients will have laser prior to any other, prior to other treatments. The third wavelength is the nitrogen oxide pathway. And this is the pathway that decreases inflammation, it decreases swelling, it increases the ability to clear cellular debris, and it decreases pain. Next slide. So when do you use low level laser? So again, everything I'm talking about today is contraindicated. Whoops, if you can go back. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's contraindicated in pregnancy. It should never be done over the region of the neck, the thyroid, your powerhouse. So you cannot do it on an ear, nose and throat lymphedema patient. Never over the eyes. So we wear protective glasses when we treat. Um, you never want to um, put the light over top of active cancer. The literature says anywhere from, it shouldn't be done anywhere from six months to five years post-cancer. Never done over the, during the use of any prescription medication that causes photosensitivity. Those are your st steroid drugs. Never, so you'd never wanna do it over, uh, do it when someone's on prednisone until the 15th day after the last dose. Never over electronic implants, over a port or patients with epilepsy. So when you look at that list, it's pretty safe to do on a lymphedema limb. So indications are it can relieve muscle and joint aches, pain, stiffness, muscle spasm, pain and stiffness associated with arthritis, um, management of edema, and a, an increase in rate of tissue regeneration and healing. So if you have any of that list, uh, laser is something you probably want to consider. Next slide, please. So with laser, we, we like to treat with many hats on here and we like to have a toolbox of many things. So I will have patients who say, I absolutely don't want laser, even though I may feel that it's really safe for them. So we, so we would pull from our box. And in that case, I would do MLD. But with laser, we apply the pads in the same fashion that we would do MLD. And this is the arterial uh, law where you treat proximal to distal. And this is taught in the MLD training. And you, so you always, you don't want to like with a lower limb or let's say a lymphedema limb with a lot of swelling to the hand, you would never start treatment at the hand when you're doing manual lymphatic drainage massage. And you would never start laser at the hand. You want to open things proximal to distal. If the patient had active lymph nodes, like positive lymph nodes, I would stay away from that axilla, but I would treat down the arm with laser. Often breast cancer patients present with congestion and swelling in the arm and axilla. So you place the pad or the dioid first on, on the axilla, then on the arm, then on the hand. And you combine this with manual lymphatic drainage massage and compression. But you will see your need for MLD to go way down when using laser and compression. Next slide, please. So the efficacy, it produces a clinically significant reduction in limb volume and pain immediately after the conclusion of low level laser treatments. And that's from a broad study in 2015. In a systemic 
uh, in a systematic review and meta-analysis published in the Journal of Cancer Survivors in June of 2015, they were looking to determine the effect of low-level laser therapy on pain in people who have survived breast cancer and the effect on breast cancer-related lymphedema. Nine study studies met the inclusion criteria of having a pooled effect size and 95% confidence intervals when referring to limb volume and pain. It was concluded that the use of low level laser therapy produced a significantly a clinical significant reduction in limb volume and pain immediately after the, the low level laser treatments. In an updated lit review on modalities that cancer survivors are treated with this uh, low level laser, it also concluded that it improved outcome when applied, but that in that same study, it must be very, you must be very careful at determining where to apply the laser. So it is safe for post mastectomy lymphedema. It's, um, I believe it's an optimal treatment, um, but you need to know the, the parameter as well, the site, the duration, the cancer history, in our clinic here in Ottawa, we would never apply laser with, we, for every new assessment, we get the latest um, MRI, CT scan and dictations, generally within a few minutes from the Ottawa hospital, where we review that and determine case by case if, if laser is um, something that can be used. And it's definitely contraindicated within six months after radiation or up to five years in the literature. So just to conclude my thoughts on laser, it's very effective for treating and managing lymphedema. It's been recommended by the Society for Integrative Oncology Guidelines, the Working Group and the American Cancer Society. And I have a whole list of references later that you can look at at the end. Uh, laser with bandaging may offer a time-saving therapeutic option to conventional MLD and subjectively laser improve the skin. Laser confers clinically meaningful reductions in arm volume and pain in women with breast cancer related lymphedema. And laser can modulate inflammatory processes in a dose dependent manner and can be titrated to significantly reduce acute inflammatory pain in clinical settings. Next slide. So the other thing I'm gonna talk about is AccuHealth. Um, I've been using it in the breast rehab population for a little over 20 years. Um, it's pretty much used on every single patient that we see. It, I have to kind of restate like this, there's not a lot of literature. I couldn't, re I, there's not a lot of literature to show you this machine. And I should tell you that I'm using it against the patent. <laughs> So about um, 28 years ago, I took an acupuncture course and I came back from Toronto from the course and I found this machine in the cupboard of an outpatient physio department at the Ottawa hospital and I dusted it off. And um, this machine picks up skin resistance and scars are skin resistance and scars block lymphatic flow. And that's why patients are more prone to getting secondary lymphedema, especially if they have an adhesive scar or they develop a seroma. So this little machine, um, it's patented to find acupuncture points. So um, acupuncture is a whole other topic, but um, acupuncture points are points of skin resistance. And so that's what this machine is patented for. But I thought, okay, scars are resistance, and I started using it to assess scars. So it's a small handheld electric modality which combines modern technology with the ancient art of acupuncture. It produces a tiny electric current that simulates points of resistance along energy channels. And I must say, if you read the literature in the book that comes with this machine, it says don't use on cancer patients. Same with the ultrasound machine, don't use on cancer patients. Same with laser, don't use on cancer patients. So you want your clinician to really be aware of the intricacies of your diagnosis. Um, it measures and alerts practi practitioners to points of resistance in the body and can 
subsequently be stimulated. I also use it to stimulate the ear. Uh, physiotherapists study embryology and the entire body is mapped out on the ear. And so I will often stimulate the ear at the beginning of the assessment and that will direct me to where to treat that patient um, or where to focus my treatment that uh, in that session. Next slide. So I'm just gonna, um, we're going to try and play this. You're going to see me do a uh, um, treatment of a scar. So that's me with a post mastectomy patient. We're not sure if this is going to work. I think it should hopefully. Oh, thank you. There. So you're hearing. So I'm over an adhesive scar. So the person is lying with their head up. They have a scar that's a bit concave. I've assessed the scar and now I'm, I'm treating it. So I've got my index finger on the back of the machine that I'm grounded there. So that metal piece ground, uh, gives me grounding. And then I'm on the top part of the machine, I'm stimulating. And so this makes up a, a good part of my treatment day. <laughs> I treat a lot of scars here. And I would not just focus on that. Let's say that patient also had a hysterectomy or some other surgery, not over a metal implant. You as a, the practitioner would want to assess and treat all scars because scars block lymphatic flow. Next slide, please. So just to recap, the indications for acute health are, you can use it over painful trigger points. It's super good on treating ear points, adherent scar tissue postoperatively, and treatment of cording. So we use this a lot in auxiliary web cording syndrome, which is when you get a really tight band of cording, a band of tight tissue in the pectoralis major muscle over top of the breast. The contraindications, you would never use this over a pacemaker, over metal implants, or over open wounds or infections. Next slide, please. Um, so this is taken pretty much directly from the book. Um, so again, like I'm using it against the patent, but this kind of just goes over when you want to use it for acupuncture points. Um, but a light will go on when you have um, scar tissue and that light would direct you on where to stem the point. Okay, so you basically move the AccuHealth above and below the scar and you treat above and below the scar. It's safe to perform on all closed wounds. You would never use this on a wound that's still open. Next slide, please. So um, as I said earlier, the literature is not superb um, for the use of this machine. Um, I think we own about 15 of these machines and all staff are trained on this machine. If you were to take this machine away, I would cry. <laughs> it's just been so effective in treating breast patients or any cancer patient with a scar. Um, but again, I would never do it on a melanoma scar. So again, it's gotta be case by case, but it, the, I'll, t I'll just recap a bit of what the literature says. Um, it can be used to stem acupuncture points. It's also, the trade name is AccuScope. Oh, sorry, the trade name is AccuHealth, but it can, but it, um, it's also, this machine can be called AccuScope. It's been shown to have um, help in lowering blood pressure, pulse, blood coagulation, respiratory issues, gastro. A lot of what you would see in acupuncture, home, hormone secretion, it's decreased body temperature. So this is based on one study. In another kind of weak study, it was a case study of a 45-year-old woman who had undergone a breast augmentation and the use of the scope helped her in reducing pain. Um, that study used it over a scar. It's been shown to really help with uh, stimulating ear, um, uh, ear, the Shen Men point in the ear, which can really help calm the nervous system and help with sleep. And it was used to find the AccuHealth point of spleen six. Um, compression of spleen six acupuncture point was an effective compl complementary method to decrease maternal anxiety and analgesic consumption, especially 
um, with um, pethidine. Next slide. So just to recap, laser is safe and effective for treatment of many conditions in breast rehab. It's recommended for treatment of arm lymphedema related to breast cancer. Ultrasound improves tissue healing and decreased pain. AccuHealth can be used for muscular skeletal conditions or traditional Chinese medicine purposes. And it's effective at improving scar appearance and decreasing adherence. I believe um, the majority of lymphedema, the majority of lymphedema patients that I've seen in the past two decades, a lot of their swelling presents around the scar and then travels. And dry needling promotes healing and decreases source irritation. And where I love to use dry needling, if I have an advanced lymphedema arm patient, I will needle the chest muscle. But I would never do needling of the chest muscle if someone doesn't have lymphedema. And that, by needling the chest muscle, I can re release a large trigger point that could be blocking lymphatic flow. Next slide. So if you have any questions, you can uh, email me um, and that's it. Thank you.